All right. Good morning, and thank you all for attending our annual year-end close procedure for Microsoft Dynamics GP. Just a note, we will be recording this session and sending it out when it's available. It should be uh, the next uh, couple of days, possibly Monday. So today, uh, presenting will be me, uh, Ron Peterson, the Manufacturing Practice Manager here at OTT, and Sarah Britton will um, also be presenting. She's a senior ERP consultant. Okay, so today's agenda will be broken down into a few different pieces. I'll be starting off with um, some installation uh, and upgrade information for those of you that would be attempting or upgrading uh, GP. Uh, we will then switch over to Sarah, who will be talking about the year and close procedures for receivables, payables, uh, fixed assets, and general ledger. Let's switch back to myself. We'll be discussing manufacturing field service and the distribution modules of sales, purchasing, and inventory. Uh, Sarah will then wrap up with uh, HR payroll and we'll take any questions that you may have at the end. All right. So again, uh, this first piece here will be for those uh, upgrading the service pack for the version they are uh, for the version they are on. It would be for Dynamics GP 2016 and higher. And if you do go out to Customer Source and grab the latest service pack, it is all inclusive of all prior updates for that version. So you would. Uh, update uh, the server as well as all of the clients. Otherwise, uh, if you miss a client, that client will get a version error and won't be able to log in until they're updated. Also, you should uh, verify uh, that any ISV products that you are using are either compatible with the service pack, the latest service pack update, or they have a, uh, an update for that, uh, for that service pack. Okay, so before you begin, we have some uh, pre-install upgrade tips. So of course, we would recommend that you back up the Dynamics system database, as well as all of the other company databases that you may have. You should also export the modified reports and forms uh, into package files. And you do that through uh, tools, customize, customization, maintenance, and just archive those. And then back up the modified forms and reports dictionary, either copy them off or uh, copy them uh, or make a local copy and rename the extension. And we also do recommend as uh, to create a standalone test environment to, to test the upgrade prior to, uh, to doing it in the live environment. Okay, so just some upgrade tips for you. You would need to uh, do the upgrade uh, as a uh, as SA and that or, or DynSA, and obviously that account must have uh, domain access uh, admin rights. So there are two components to doing the upgrade. It would be updating the application, which would be updating GP. And then once that's upgraded, it will roll into upgrading the systems database, the Dynamics database, and then um, the company databases. 
you would want, we typically uh, do the first upgrade on the client, on the Dynamics client on the SQL Server and test everything there. And once that's done, you can roll out the upgrades to the user clients. Okay, so some install and upgrade tips. Right, as I mentioned before, uh, the latest service pack includes um, all of the uh, all of the upgrades, and then also verify that you do have all of the latest versions for any of the the ISPs or any of the additional products that you're using. So, if there are errors or if the if, it, if the upgrade fails, there are some knowledge-based links that, that can help, um, and you can access those through the PowerPoint uh, that was sent. These are fairly standard. Um, these would cover the, the vast majority of the errors that you would possibly get and the, the ways to fix those errors. Okay, you may also want to enable the, the DEX SQL log in the, uh, the DEX INI file, which would allow you to trap uh, and diagnose any SQL errors if there are any. Just don't forget to turn that off when you're done. And I'd also like to point out if the, if the, the database upgrade fails, don't panic um, and don't restore the databases. Uh, you can almost always continue to forge ahead and use some of the fixes here uh, to, to, to make any adjustments that you need and, and soldier forward and be able to complete the upgrade. You'll know that an upgrade for a company or a database failed if there's a red X in the company name, name in the update company window. And again, there are links here um, for troubleshooting uh, if it if it does fail. Okay. So once the databases are complete, you'll want to go into Dynamics Utilities and upgrade the modified forms and reports. So one thing, uh, if you do notice that account numbers for any of your users are, are printing uh, strangely on any of the reports like the trial balance, or some users are crashing when they're printing uh, financial reports, it's probably due to a damaged reports dictionary. There have been some changes with the latest version. So all you need to do is, is rebuild that one again. And remember, uh, Verify where the reports are, uh, and you, you only need to um, update uh, the shared dictionaries once if uh, all the users are pointing to that dictionary. And once that's done, the service pack can be pushed out uh, via group, group policy or whatever mass deployment tools that you need or done on an individual basis. <clears throat> okay, so once you are done, we would, of course, recommend that you back up the Dynamics database as well as all of the company databases. You then export out to package files all of the successfully upgraded modified forms and reports, archive those. And as I had mentioned before, there's been some changes, uh, table changes with the latest GP. Uh, 2018 release for the general ledger. So you should uh, re, uh, you should reconfigure change tracking for your management reporter data mart. And this is in uh, the management reporter configuration console under the data mart integration. If you have any questions regarding that, uh, you can just contact us. Okay. I will turn it over to Sarah.
All right. Um, so I'm gonna not allowing me to show my screen. Can you do not you know a change presenter? Oh, never mind. I think I can do it here. Oh, we got. All right. <clears throat> All right, can you guys see my screen then? I can. I think it's... It's not in presentation mode. There we go. Is that better? Yep. All right. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk about uh, receivables management year-end closing procedures. Um, when should the close be done? So both the calendar year and fiscal year close should be done at the end of the calendar year prior to posting any transactions in the next calendar year. Of course, the fiscal year, if your fiscal year is different from your calendar year, that should be done at the time that you close um, or at the end of your fiscal year. The year-end close process, and I will be honest, there's a lot of people that actually don't even do the year-end close process for receivables management. Um, the calendar year-end close, it will clear the calendar year-to-date um, finance charges, and then it moves them into the last year calendar field in the um, customer finance charge summary. The fiscal year-end close, that transfers all amounts other than the calendar year-to-date finance charge amount to the last year column in that customer summary. So what steps should you take to close the year? Um, step one is to make sure all of your receivables transactions for the entire year are posted. So make sure there's no outstanding batches with transactions that should be um, in the current fiscal or calendar year. We always recommend, um, as you're going to see throughout this webinar, just a ton of backups. Um, if you're doing your year-end close all on the same day, you know you don't have to do a backup after every single step in um, the close process. But um, if you're doing them separately on different days and things like that, it is not a bad idea to make a year-end backup before you're closing. Then you close the year. Um, the calendar year, then you're going to close the fiscal period if it is also the end of your fiscal period, um, and then you're going to close the tax tax year. And then after you're done closing, it also suggests to make a post year and closing backup. Um, and again, that's just a suggestion, um, and it's up to you guys and your internal processes. Um, key points to remember, obviously, is making restorable backups. Um, there's a KB, KB article there, a knowledge-based article, uh, that talks a little bit about making those restorable bas backups and when they're recommended. Uh, Restorables management is not completely date sensitive. Um, there are some date sensitive features, so the best option is to make sure that you're closing the year on time. Uh, what that means is, you can't, um, you have to before, after you finish posting all of your transactions for the current calendar year or fiscal year, you wanna make sure that you close that receivables before you do any posting of receivables in the new year. So the calendar year and close routine should be run at the end of the calendar year prior to posting transactions in the new year. And same thing with the, the fiscal year and close. It should be run at the end of the fiscal year and before you post any transactions in the new year. So a little bit more information about what the actual what the actual um, what the actual process is for receivables management. Um, Basically, what it does is in SmartList, uh, you can see that there's uh, there's some columns in there for last year data, and in that customer summary window, there's information for last fiscal year, um, last calendar year, uh, year to date, this year, and um, what it basically does is it it moves the data that's in the current year 
column. And when you close it, it moves that data into the last year column. So if you do, you know, miss, I guess, closing receivables before uh, you post new transactions in the new year, it's not the end of the world. You're just not going to be able to rely on the data in that last year column in um, the customer summary as well as the smart list. So again, there's a lot of customers that actually have never run the receivables year in closing process. Obviously, we recommend it, but it's not the end of the world if it doesn't get done at the exact, exact right time. So we're going to move on to uh, payables management year end. Um, very similar to receivables um, where the calendar year end should be run at the end of the calendar year before you post any transactions. Same thing in the fiscal year. You're going to want to finish your fiscal year um, currently all posting in that fiscal year and then you run that payables management year end before you do any posting in the new fiscal year. So um, again, like receivables, the payables management year end process, it um, makes some changes in the vendor yearly summary window. Uh, the calendar close will transfer the 1099 amounts from the year to date column to the last year column um, in the amounts since last close view. And then the fiscal close, that's gonna transfer all other amounts from the year to date column to the last year column. So same thing, there's um, a window in there amount since last close. Uh, and in uh, SmartList, there will be some columns for last year data. Basically, it's just moving the information from current to last year when you do that payables management year and close. So what steps should be taking? Basically, very similar to receivables, there's a couple extra steps with payables because you've got the 1099s, but um, you're going to post all of your payables transactions for the year. We always recommend printing the historical age trial balance report. Um, it's just good to have that for your records and then also take a look at that after you do the year-end close and make sure everything's still looking you know, like it should. Um, the year-end update, uh, we do suggest installing that year-end update if necessary. If you are printing 1099s out of GP, um, that year-end update is going to be something that you need this year. Typically, the year-end update is something that we usually only recommend or highly strongly suggest for our payroll clients because there's a lot of payroll data, um, regulatory changes and things like that that's required if you're running payroll out of GP. However, this year, because the IRS made the change to the 1099 um, NEC or the 1099 non-employee compensation, they added a new form in there. So uh, if, again, you are running 1099s out of GP, you're going to want to um, install that year-end update. Uh, step four is going in and verifying um, your 1099 information, making any edits as necessary, and then you're going to print your 1099 statements. Uh, again, we're going to suggest that you make a pre-year-end backup, close the year, um, close your, any fiscal periods that you have open, and then again, make another post-year-end backup. And again, those backups, they, they do get redundant. So um, you don't need to make a backup every step of the way. It's just a recommendation. Important uh, points to remember, again, payables management is not fully date sensitive. Uh, so it's recommended that you process your year end closing routines at the actual year end. Uh, your vendor should be marked as 1099, as a 1099 vendor at the time the transactions are posted or paid. Um, and that needs to be done in order for the 1099 information to auto-populate. There is a knowledge-based article out there um, on how to correct that if you did not properly mark your vendor as a 1099 vendor. Uh, you can go into the 1099 details window and you can edit 1099 amounts individually. Um, this next slide, this is some very important 1099 changes. Uh, I mentioned briefly uh, that last couple slides that there are some big changes um, 
the 1099 miscellaneous, there are changes to that form because basically it's removing box seven from the 1099 miscellaneous and they're moving it to the box one of the 1099 NEC, which is the non-employee compensation. So that form is a brand new form um, in GP. The 1096 form was also modified to include that uh, new NEC amount. So the most significant change obviously is the breakout of the non-employee compensation from box seven of the 1099 miscellaneous to its own form. So that um, 1099 miscellaneous box seven is again now reported in box one of the new 1099 NEC. Uh, there is a frequently asked asked questions section in the payables chapter of the year end booklet um, that you can refer to. There's a little bit more information about how GP is handling historical, um, historical data as it relates to the 1099 miscellaneous. Uh, as part of the year end update, GP is basically automatically rolling over anything that you currently have set up in your 1099 miscellaneous box seven is automatically going to be changed to be put on the 1099 NEC box one. So GP does take care of that part for you. You don't need to go in and update all of your box seven vendors to the new 1099 form. GP does that as part of the year end update. All right. Moving on, we've got fixed assets year and close. Uh, so when should this year and close be done? Uh, it should be processed after you've closed payables management, uh, but you wanna make sure that you do it before you close general ledger. You can close each book separately, but all of your books must be closed before you can do any processing in that fixed assets module for the new year. So what does the year and close process do? Um, so the year to date maintenance window, year to date maintenance amount is cleared from the last maintenance date window. Um, the quantity is copied to the begin quantity field in the expand quantity window. So again, in the asset card, there's just some information about the current fiscal year that gets updated when you do the year and close for the last year. Um, in the asset book window, obviously your year to date depreciation amount is cleared because you're starting out in a new year, so there is no year to date depreciation. Um, the cost basis is gonna be copied to the begin year cost field. Life to date depreciation is going to be copied over to the begin reserve field, and the salvage value is copied to begin salvage field. Also, um, in the book setup window, uh, the current fiscal year is increased for each closed book. So once you close a book, it's going to update the current fiscal year that shows in the book setup. GP 2015 and later has fixed assets year-end reports. So there is a new report that was added in GP 2015 um, for that year-end process. So it just gives a status of all of the assets affected by that close. So what steps should I take to close the year? So you're gonna first perform the year and close for your payables management. Um, all of your fixed asset transactions should be entered for the year and you should depreciate all assets through the end of the year. Um, after that is finished, you wanna make sure that you do your GL posting process. Um, any required year-end reports that you usually run for your year-end process, you should run at this time. You wanna go in and verify the calendar and quarter setup for the next period. Um, again, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and create a backup before you close the year. And that's about it for fixed assets. So after your fixed assets, payables and receivables are closed, you can then move on to closing the general ledger. So the general ledger year and close should be done after you've completed the year and process for all of, all of the other modules. Um, other modules should be closed in the following order. Uh, you should do inventory first, receivables, 
payables, and then finally fixed assets. The year and close process, it moves all of your open year transactions from the GL 20,000 table, which is the open year table, to the GL 30,000 table, which is the historical table. It will automatically create a balance brought forward journal entry um, that's created in the GL 20,000. It will remove inactive GL accounts without a balance or history. Um, GP 2013. R2 and up will also clear out unit accounts if that option is marked during the year and close process. The balances for all balance sheet accounts are rolled forward to the new year. So um, until you actually close the period in general ledger, um, your financial statements obviously will be incorrect for the following year until that the previous year is closed. Um, the beginning balance in the new year for the balance sheet accounts will be the same as the ending balance if you at, um, after your closing. The P&L accounts are rolled into retained earnings um, if you close to one retained earnings account um, or with the amount from the P&L accounts in that division if you close to the divisional retained earnings. Um, P&L accounts will have a zero balance at the beginning of the new year. Fiscal period tables are updated to mark the year just closed as a historical year. Um, it will, if you're using analytical accounting, automatically close analytical accounting. Um, you wanna make sure that you print that year on close report because you cannot reprint it after the fact. So what steps should I take to close the year? Um, you wanna complete closing procedures for all other modules as previously stated. Um, post any final adjusting entries, um, account posting type review. So what that means is you wanna make sure that if you created any new GL accounts in during the year and you had activity to those accounts, you wanna make sure that you correctly identified those accounts as either a balance sheet account or a profit and loss account. Um, if you don't do that, obviously the year and close procedure and when it goes and creates a journal entry, it's going to incorrectly um, account for that account. So if you mark a P&L as a balance sheet, obviously there's gonna be a problem with that retained earnings entry that gets made when you close the year. Um, we do have instructions, I believe, in the year-end closing booklet about how you can create a smart list that will go through and identify, possibly identify any accounts that were marked incorrectly. So again, you wanna make sure that you do that before you close the year. Um, next thing is to perform any file maintenance. You're gonna to wanna to go in and check your general ledger settings. Um, it's just a safeguard as part of the year in processing for every year is to go in and make sure that you have the option in your general ledger setter, settings um, to maintain history. Um, if that option is unmarked, Basically, what's going to happen is it's going to wipe all your data from your previous year when you close the year. Um, we have had clients that have done this before, uh, and then by the time they realize that it's gone, you know, it's it's gone. They don't have a backup because they didn't perform a backup, and they marked that option or unmarked, unmarked the option to keep history, and they basically lost all of their historical data. So. We do have that laid out in the year-end booklet. You wanna make sure that you're following those steps and making sure that everything's looking the way it should before you do the year-end close. Um, and again, that's why we say make a backup. I do highly suggest that that backup is made before you do any year-end closing pro process. Um, some of the other modules, receivables, payables, if you don't wanna do those backups, you know that's that's up to you guys, but you really should do a backup before you do the general ledger year and close. Um, next step is to print your trial balance because you're gonna wanna be able to look at that trial balance um, before you post the year and closing, and then again after just to make sure that everything's looking as expected. Uh, print your final financial statements. So go through and print your P&L, your balance sheet, 
uh, you're going to want to set up your new fiscal year before you close the previous year. Most people already have that done because they're already posting information into the next fiscal year. Um, step 10 is to close the year and then there is a separate fiscal period close for all the modules if you want to go and mark those as closed as well. Uh, after you close, you're going to want to print the summary trial balance and just verify that everything looks like it should um, as part of that year and close process. And if you are doing budgets um, in GP, you're going to want to go and adjust any budget numbers um, for the next year. And then step 14, obviously, we recommend making another backup. Um, this one's not as important as the one that you make before you actually close the year. Some important points to remember, um, make a backup. I will stress it again, do not bypass any errors that pop up or that pop up during the close process. So make your backup and don't bypass any errors. You wanna have all other users out of GP when you perform that year and close for general ledger. Uh, we do suggest that you do that close at the server. You wanna make sure that you have enough free space on your server to allow for that GL20,000 table to basically double in size. Um, sometimes the year and close routine does appear to hang at 50%, but it is still processing, so let it run. Do not close out a GP, let it finish. Um, one of the nice things about some of the newer versions of GP is that it does allow you to reverse the year and close. So if you do, by some chance, you know, close the process or close the year before you have all your adjusting entries in. Um, there's a couple different options. You can either allow uh, GP to post into history. So if you do that, you can still post your, um, your adjusting entries and it'll go back and post that into a historical year and do the um, retained earnings journal entry for you as part of that. The other option obviously is to go in and reopen the entire year post your journal entries, and then reclose the year as well. So um, older versions of GP didn't allow that. These newer versions do, so that's a really nice, safe feature to have so that you don't feel, I guess, too under pressure if you, if you do miss some adjusting entries. Um, but that is about it for the general ledger year-end close. So I will hand it back to Ron. I'll go ahead and make you presenter, Ron. Okay. All right, uh, you can see my screen? I can see it, yep. Perfect, <clears throat> okay. All right, uh, so manufacturing and field service. So there is, there's no predefined procedure to close the year for manufacturing uh, or field service. Uh, but the procedures listed below here are recommended uh, to ensure that, that the inventory module closes correctly. So regardless of which product you own or, uh, or you, you do work orders or manufacturing orders with, um, the key thing to accomplish prior to year end is, is just to treat it like you would for any uh, other month end. Um, whether you use Dynamics, GP, Bill of Materials, or uh, GP Manufacturing, or Horizons Manufacturing. What you want to do is process any applicable um, material issues or labor transactions that need to be recorded in the current month. Um, you'd also want to uh, post uh, and close any manufacturing orders that need to be completed. So as with manufacturing, uh, if you have or, or, or if you use uh, the field service module, uh, be sure to process any contracts or service calls or returns or equipment transactions and work orders uh, prior to the month end so that the so that the appropriate revenues and expenses are rec recognized. Um, so these same routines for manufacturing and for field service would, would be the ones that would be required during any month end processing throughout the year. 
So if both manufacturing and field service are utilized, then just whatever business process uh, uh, that you use should dictate the order that the, the transaction should be processed. If you have any questions about that, just uh, contact us at uh, OTT support. Okay, so then we'll, once manufacturing is completed, we'll move to sales order processing. So again, there are no required procedures for closing sales orders, sales order processing. But these are highly recommended to ensure that inventory closes correctly. So again, you should process and post all applicable transactions. So this is, this is important so, uh, to ensure that the, the historical amounts are accurate for the year that you're closing and that the, um, the year to date's accurate for the upcoming month. So the first thing that you should do is reconcile the sales documents. And you can go into the sales order utilities and you'll see uh, a reconcile and a remove. So you would reconcile first <clears throat> and that verifies that the sales order documents and the quantities and the uh, serial and lot quantities are correct. And then also remove, it seems scary, but it's not actually removing them, it's just it's just moving quotes and orders and back orders into history from open. If they don't contain a deposit and all of the line items have a remaining quantity of zero. So it just cleans them up and moves them to history. Right, once you do purchasing or once you do sales orders, you move to purchasing. So again, there are no required procedures for closing purchase order processings. It's just recommended so that inventory closes correctly. So you would process and post all applicable transactions for this year. Again, it's important so that the historical amounts are accurate for the closing year and the year to date for the upcoming month. So again, reconciling the purchase orders. And when you do that, uh, it will recalculate and adjust all the quantities, the item quantities, the sub the document subtotals, the status, the costs, and the discounts of all of the outstanding purchase orders. And, it, and then you would want to also remove in the same utility uh, the completed purchase orders. Similar to sales orders, it will move to history any completed closed or canceled documents that weren't automatically moved for whatever reason uh, into history. We also recommend that you print some reports just for archiving in your permanent records, the, uh, the purchase order analysis reports, um, the received not invoiced, and um, that would allow you to reconcile report to your, uh, reconcile to your group purchases liability account. Okay, so that moves us into inventory. So when should this be done? Uh, it should be, uh, inventory should be closed at the end of the fiscal year before any new inventory transactions uh, would be posted. All right, so what does it do? Uh, what does it affect? So when you close inventory, it transfers all current year quantities, costs, and sales amounts uh, to last year um, for items which you have been keeping sales history. And that's uh, a checkbox in the items options window. It will then update the beginning quantity um, from the quantity on hand at each site or each location that the that the item can exist in and it will zero out the quantity sold field in the item quantities maintenance for each site and it will also during the close give you the option to remove items that you've marked as discontinued uh, remove sold receipts and sold lot attributes and update the items standard cost if you're using the standard cost not through uh, 
of the manufacturing standard cost module, just the GP standard standard cost module. Okay, so what steps should you take to close the year? So as we mentioned before, enter and post all sales orders and purchase order transactions that uh, are applicable for the current year. Reconcile those two modules. And ideally, you would complete a, a, physical, in, a physical inventory and post the variance adjustments. Uh, some, some reports that you should print would be the inventory stock status, the purchase receipts, turnover receipt, transaction history, serial number list, and a lot number list um, for archiving purposes, and then uh, close the year. Okay, so just some key points to remember. Uh, I can back up, of course. If you're using sales orders and purchasing, um, you should you really should reconcile these modules first. Uh, when you reconcile inventory, it initially looks at those two modules to calculate what the quantities should be in inventory. So if either SOP and or POP are incorrect, then inventory will be incorrect. So reconcile sales orders, reconcile purchase orders, and then reconcile in inventory. So as a side note, uh, this would be a great time to implement the historical inventory trial balance report. Uh, if you have not already, uh, gives you a perfect line in the sand to, to be able to move forward with. And if you are using manufacturing standard cost, uh, it would be a great time to do a roll up and a revalue of the inventory. <clears throat> so in the, in the PowerPoint that you received, um, there are some uh, documents for reference uh, that you can click on if you need to regarding uh, processes, procedures, uh, and what if you accidentally close your inventory twice and how can you recover from that? Okay, now I'll turn it over to you, Sarah. Yep, all right. So I will go ahead and make myself presenter again. All right, can you see my screen, Ron? I can. Okay. So the US payroll year-end closing, um, that process, it creates the year-end wage file that contains the annual wage information that's used to generate your W-2s, your W-3s, 1099 R's, and your 1099, or 1094 and 1095s. And then also the uh, magnetic media if you are um, install or submitting electronically for those W-2s. Um, here's a quick reminder, a couple of reminders for you. So with the release of GP 2016 R2, uh, users can now print W-2s on plain paper. Uh, you still need that W-3 but you can print uh, your W-2s onto plain paper, so you don't need to purchase as many W-2 forms. Um, support will end on July 14th, 2021 for GP 2016. So 2015 is out of support. There's no updates for 2015. This is the last year and update for GP 2016. If you're on that version, you'll want to plan on upgrading at some point during this year. Uh, your 1095 form changes in this year end. If you are printing your 1095s from GP, I know there's not a lot of you, but that form now includes um, a spot for the employee age. Um, for this to properly print on the form, you wanna make sure that you have the date of birth for your employees populated on the employee card. 
Um, I know that's not a required field, but if you are printing 1095s from GP, you want to make sure that date of birth is in the employee card. Uh, steps to take um, to close the year. You want to verify your version of GP. You must be on either GP 2016 or what's now called just GP. They changed the versioning. They went to a different uh, versioning system. So it's not going to be like GP 2018 or GP 2020. It's basically they're switching back and now it's going to be like J GP 18.2 or 18.3. Um, the version for the year-end update is actually GP 18.3, um, and that's the 2020 year-end. You want to make sure that you complete all of your 2020 pay runs, uh, complete all your monthly and quarterly period end procedures that um, are part of your normal processing for 2020. You're going to want to go ahead and do the uh, year-end backup. Um, obviously, the year-end backup should be done uh, before you do any sort of year-end update. The year-end update, um, there's only one year-end year -end update, so there's not a separate year-end update for AP or a separate year-end update for payroll. It's all one year-end update. Uh, you can install that year-end update at any time. You do not need to wait until you've completed all of your 2020 pay runs. Um, they provide it in November to, number one, give the third-party product um, providers enough time to make their products compatible with that release, but they also give it to you in enough time so that you can um, plan to install that and it doesn't interfere with any of your normal year-end processing. So again, that year-end update can be installed at any time. You do not need to wait until you're ready to close. You do not need to wait until you've completed all your pay runs. You don't wanna install your tax update but you do want to install the year-end update um, that contains those W-2 changes. Actually, there's none for this year, but um, you do want to make sure that that's installed in plenty of time before you're ready to um, actually process your year-end. Uh, after that year-end update is installed um, and you finish all of your 2020 pay runs and all of your 2020 quarterly and period-end procedures, you're going to want to go ahead and create the year-end wage file. So you do want to make a pre-year-end backup. Um, you need to keep that backup, I think, for the IRS, um, what is it, I think seven years. Uh, you're also, after you do your year-end process, make another year-end backup called a post-year-end backup. Uh, go in and verify your 1099-R and your W-2 uh, statement information. Make any edits to your W-2s or your 1095-Cs, um, if there are any edits edits that are necessary. At that time, obviously, you're going to want to make it before you go in and print any of those forms. Um, so you're going to want to do your W-2 validation report, print your W-2s, um, get your W-3 transmittal form if that's something that you're um, transmitting uh, via paper rather than electronically, uh, print your 1095-C and your 1094-C transmittal. Um, the 1099-R validation report, um, print those, and then, the, of course, your 1096 transmittal form as well. The W-2 electronic file at that point, um, if you are filing electronically, you can create that electronic file for uploading to the appropriate, um, appropriate IRS or uh, Minnesota Revenue. Uh, then you want to go ahead and close your fiscal periods for the payroll. Uh, that's an optional step. You don't need to do that. Um, after you've done your year-end wage file and you've completed all 2020 pay runs, at that point you can go out and look for your 2021 payroll tax update. So you want to make sure, again, that you create your year-end wage file and complete any 2020 pay runs before you install the tax update, and you want to make sure that you install that tax update before you process payroll for 2021. And again, all of this information is in the year-end booklet that we provided you as well. Um, there's an alternate checklist if you need to run 2021 um, pay runs before, um, before actually creating the wage file. 
um, actually before processing uh, your W-2s and your 1099-R statements. Actually, I, I apologize to take that back. You do need to complete all of your 2020 year end, or 2020 payrolls and run that year-end wage file um, before you process any 2021 pay runs, but you can process 2021 pay runs before you print your W-2s. Um, the year-end wage file, the history is held in the UPR 10100 through the UPR 10107 tables. Uh, that's where the year-end wage report information is held in there. Um, you can always edit and print your W-2s. So if you do notice that something was not properly marked as um, taxable, if you need to increase taxable wages, you can do that um, manually by editing the W-2 before you print it. Um, prior to processing pay runs in the new year, you want to install the payroll tax update round one. That's usually scheduled for release right about this time um, towards the end of December. So that should be coming out here shortly. Uh, that uh, payroll tax update can be installed just by going to your maintenance, um, the US payroll updates and the check for payroll tax updates. If you try to run that from your workstation and you receive some sort of error, you're just gonna wanna go ahead and try to run that from a server. Sometimes, I don't know what makes the difference, but sometimes it just does not work from a workstation. You have to do it from the server. Uh, some important due dates. Um, nothing too earth shattering here. They moved uh, the W-2 statements just a day because I think the 31st lands on a Sunday. So your W-2 statements are gonna be due on February 1st, 2021 this year. Uh, 1095C statements, they moved that back. So you do not need to furnish those 1095C statements to your employees now until March 2nd. Um, your 1095C statements to the Social Security Administration when filed on paper though have to be due on the February 28th of 2021. Um, if you're filing that electronically, it's not until March 31st. Uh, the 1094C transmittal on paper needs to be furnished to the SSA by February 20, 28th and when filed electronically is March 31st. So they give you a little bit more time if you're filing those electronically. There are some knowledge-based resources um, available to you uh, as part of the year-end closing procedures. So you can see here we have each of the modules um, that we cover today uh, with a corresponding knowledge-based article. So that will be included, obviously, in your copy of the slides that you receive today. Um, if you have any additional questions, uh, we're going to open it up here for questions, but you can also reach out to our technical support line. There's a phone number 651-262-2626, or you can feel free to email support, um, support at ott-inc.com. There's also the customer source website link there um, for additional information if you want to grab that information from customer source. Um, if you guys do need some help with installing that year-end update, I suggest that you reach out to us as soon as possible. Um, we have a lot of people that need to get on the schedule this year because of that payable, payables change. Um, so our calendars are filling up quickly. Um, again, like I said, you don't have to wait until you're done processing for 2020 before you install that year-end update. So I would get that done um, sooner rather than later. All right, so we can open it up to any questions. I see a couple questions did come in while we were presenting. Um, question is, if we have to install the AP update, is it okay to have unposted batches in transactions? Um, again, I just wanna reiterate the AP update is the same as the payroll update. So that's one and the same. Um, we usually do suggest to have batches or all transactions in batches posted, but I haven't run into an issue before where we've done that year in update and had unposted batches and transactions that has caused a problem. Uh, another question, I answered this one privately, but uh, what version of GP 
do we need to be on to install the urine update? And I accidentally had a typo in that. I said GP 2015 or GP 2018. It's actually GP 2016. GP 2015 is no longer um, supported. So you have to be on GP 2016 or GP 2018 to install that year end update. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, feel free to ask those questions in the question section. I think there might also be a way to raise your hand where we can actually unmute you and talk to you as well. Um, let me go see if there's anybody doing that currently. Doesn't appear so. No, okay. I'll, um, um, there I'll, um, I'll stop the recording, but we'll, we'll hang out here and answer any questions uh, that come in. Sounds good. Okay. All right, another question. If we print four up W-2s to send to employees, can we truncate the social security number in the federal and employee forms? and then decide whether or not to do so for the two state forms. That one I might have to follow up with you on, Helen. I, I don't know about that one right off the top of my head. Um, I'd have to look and see if that is an option uh, to do it for some and not others. Uh, so I will follow up with you on that one. 